I can hardly count how many years it's been since I graduated from Amherst. I was in the class of 1942. It's been a long while, um, but um, I did find, as soon as I wasn't in the Army and it was possible, that I was a faithful old grad coming back to every reunion. And of course, I've lived not too far from Amherst for a number of years. Uh, so uh, Amherst is not a surprise to me. Uh, I am very happy to come back to it and to find it in such good shape. My first poem, yes, was published in the Saturday Evening Post. And I was, I was away in Europe with the 36th Infantry Division. And I su suppose I sent a little poem to my wife by V-mail. And she liked it. And she had a friend named Betsy who worked on the Saturday Evening Post. She sent it to her. And the poem was therefore published in the, in the post as by Private Richard Wilbur, and it was surrounded by stars and stripes. It was made perfectly clear that there was an element of indulgence uh, or patriotic fervor in the publication of this poem. But it wasn't a bad little poem, uh, and I was not sorry to have broken into print. I have a funny story about being published in The New Yorker for the first time. I think the year was 1948. And I'd written a poem called At Year's End. It was a poem about the end of the year and the, and the beginning of the next. And I sent it into The New Yorker in December, not leaving them very much time. Um, and. To my amazement, I got a telephone call from Mrs. E.B. White, Catherine White, saying, Mr. Wilbur, uh, we would like to use your poem, but since New, New Year's Day is almost upon us, we don't have time to, uh, uh, we don't have time to send you proofs, uh, so we'll have to talk, it on, or talk about it over the phone. And Mrs. White said, Mr. Wilbur, I think you don't understand the difference between which and that. And I said, well, it's true, Mrs. White, I don't. My, my, I'm lazy about grammar. Uh, and all I can say is that which sounds like a kind of a, an, an, a, a rough energetic word to me. And, and, and that sounds pretty smooth. <laughs> Mrs. White absorbed that nonsense from me and said, well, uh, Mr. Fowler of Fowler's usage wouldn't approve of what you do with which and that. But however, Fowler is an Englishman, isn't he? We don't have to obey the English over here. We'll just publish your poem as you wrote it. So in it went. I don't believe in sitting down at my desk in the morning and saying, no nonsense, no, I'm going to write poems because nothing good ever comes of that kind of force writing. I think what happens to me is that I have a few notions washing around in the back of my head, a few inveterate concerns. And then I notice something out there, some object or some bit of behavior that uh, seems to call for describing. And in the process of trying to bring that to life with words, I find that it does tap into some of these uh, concerns of mine. I perhaps suspected that from the beginning. So it's a, it's a fusion of one's uh, inner and outer life that starts a poem uh, going. Something that you notice, something out there that has life in it and needs to be described. And, a, and an ideal p potential that was uh, washing around in you for some time. 
This poem is called A Measuring Worm. This yellow striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen constantly, for lack of a full set of legs, keeps humping up his back. It's as if he sent by a sort of semaphore dark omegas meant to warn of last things. Although he doesn't know it, he will soon have wings. And I too don't know toward what undreamt condition, inch by inch, I go.